when you care enough about the relationships, you're willing, you're more willing to do what it takes to keep those relationships going. And if that means conflict, even if you're conflict averse, there becomes a greater why. And I think that's a huge part of reframing what conflict is, is reshifting it into your mind to, it's not that I don't like this person, it's, and maybe I'm scared of what they might think of me or what they might say, or I don't wanna just have a fight, but it's reframing it to the bigger, I care so much about this relationship that it is more important for me to work this out now than for it to become a bigger problem in the, in the future. This is episode number 498 with Kimberly Holmes, how to resolve conflict in relationships. Hi everybody, I'm Sandy Weiner. Welcome back to Last First Date Radio, where we believe it is never too late to go on your last first date. And uh, if you would like some support in having lasting love, whether you're single or in a relationship, I wrote a book and it's called Becoming a Woman of Value, How to Thrive in Life and Love. It's filled with 30 chapters. Each chapter starts with a tip and I share those tips every week on my show. And there are exercises and stories. We have podcast interviews that have been transcribed in the book. Um, it's really, really helpful if you want to develop more core confidence and step more fully into your value. You can find it on Amazon for Kindle or paperback. And this week's tip from the book is step number 28, lean back. And what I mean by lean back is that women in particular do this more than men, I think, that we tend to, especially high achieving women, we tend to want to overdo and overgive and over everything. And then we complain that the man that we're with doesn't do enough. And I know I did this in my marriage where I was overperforming because my husband didn't pick up the slack. And so I just filled in all the spaces. And so my whole reason for saying lean back is that if you want something to change, you need to stop doing all of the things and you need to lean back and make a request that somebody does things for you, plans for you, whatever it is that you feel like you're doing too much of. State your needs and lean back. And before I bring Kimberly on, I just want to invite you to my Facebook group. It is called Your Last First Date, and it's for women over 40 who are interested in going on their last first date. We actually have not only single women in there, but a lot of people who have found relationships and have gotten married while they've been in the group because it is such a forward-focused, positive group. So join us at your last first date. And now for my guest, Kimberly Beam Holmes. She has applied her master's degree in psychology for over 10 years. She's the CEO of Marriage Helper and the CEO and host of her own podcast. And her podcast is called It Starts With Attraction. She's a wife and a mother, and she has researched the ways that attraction affects people personally and the relationships that they hold dear. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Sandy. I'm excited to be with you today. Excited to have you and talk about this topic because it's one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. Fighting. Uh, <laughs> I don't know about you, but I grew up in a home with a lot of fighting. We, we had just a lot of raised voices. And for anybody who's grown up in a home like that, I think people just immediately assume that fighting is bad, that it's unhealthy to fight. And, um, and so uh, first I would love to just talk about that. You know, what, what's good about fighting? <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, there's, it's interesting that you ask it in, in that way, because there are benefits to disagreements, to conflict, I would say how you conflict, how you engage in the conversation matters, but the fact that you disagree, the, the fact that you have conflict, the fact that you fight with people that you love, doesn't mean that the relationship is broken. It doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you or something wrong with them necessarily. It simply means this is an opportunity point for you to choose. Do I want to lean in and, and be curious about the other person, what they, what they're going through, what their viewpoint is on this, the stories they're telling themselves in their head about this. Like there's something about this that matters to them. So do I want to lean in and explore that? Or do I want to put my shield up 
and and kind of be, become defensive and make this worse. Those are those are two of the options. We actually have three options when it comes to conflict. We can turn towards it, we can turn away from it, or we can turn against it to where we become just vitriolic towards the person who, who may be hurt or angry at us. So it provides an opportunity. Conflict provides an opportunity to lean in and learn more about the relationship if we handle it correctly. Now, Sandy, I actually have a question for you because I'm interested. You said that you grew up in a house where there was a lot of fighting. How did that affect you? Mm. I knew I didn't want to do what they did. (laughs) I didn't want to raise voices, but I did want to resolve conflict with kindness and compassion. Mm -hmm. And so I tried to do that in my marriage. Um, I was unfortunately married to somebody who avoided conflict at all costs and did a lot of stonewalling and and, uh, defensiveness and name calling and all the bad things. (laughs) So I was turning towards, he was turning away and, or, or against, and the same thing with, with relationship bids, as the Gottman say, you know, we can turn towards a a bid to connect or we can turn away. And yeah, so that's why I really took such an interest in, in communication skills and conflict resolution skills because of the way I was raised and then the marriage I ended up in that did not work for me. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, it's a really good question. And I think that for, you, you see this in online dating profiles all the time, like, you know, no drama, no conflict. Mm-hmm. They don't want anything to do with any of this. And, and then people will brag about the fact that they have, they were in a marriage where nobody ever fought. And I always say, did you have an honest relationship? Because right. like, something you know. wasn't right about that. <laughs> yes. And so to have a really authentic, honest relationship, we really need to bring our full selves and we're not going to always agree on everything. No. And yeah. So let's talk about some of the things that people do fight about. What are, what are some of those top things? When it comes to romantic relationships, the top things that people fight about on the surface are going to be things like finances, uh, kids, maybe future dreams, and whether or not they align with another person. So it may look a little different in a dating relationship. Um, When someone's dating, probably more of what they're fighting about is, did you, did, were you paying attention to me? Like, did I feel like you were looking at me or, and I don't just mean that with the eyes. Did I feel like you were like, I was being loved and appreciated and it can show up in different ways. Like you, you know, that date didn't go the way I wanted it to, or why did you not do this for me on my birthday? So there can be on the surface, it might look like we're fighting about our date nights or birthdays or, you know, how to spend Christmases together or different things like that. And it's the same in marriage In marriage, it comes to more of, you know, sex, kids, finances, things that you share together, but underneath all of them, it's going to boil down to people fight about on the majority. They fight about three things, things that make them feel disrespected, unlike unliked and unloved. That is what's going to bring up that emotion in another person. So the tip that you shared at the beginning of this, the lean back tip, I laughed because I thought that is a big thing that my husband and I fight about. The, the splitting of the chores in our household. Like this is probably the one thing we keep coming back to. And when you look at the research, 69% of conflict is never going to be resolved in a relationship. And that's probably any relationship that could be with your kids, your spouse, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, 69% of things you're never going to get on the same page. And a lot of that is because of personality differences ways that you were raised, just different ways that people are and the preferences that they have about things. So the goal isn't necessarily resolution. The goal is compromise. The goal is understanding each other, but that leaves this other 31% of conflict that you can resolve. You can actually lean in and, and come to some kind of agreement. So with my husband and I, when it comes to this, um, chore splitting as an example, I've, we've pretty much come to terms that we're never going to fully agree on what this looks like, but what can we do? We can talk about it. Like every week have a check-in, Hey, this week, how can I help you more with the household chores? What are you expecting of me? And what is it that you can do to help me a bit more? And what am I expecting of you? And putting that out on, on the front end, because bottom line is both of us hate it. 
both of us hate chores. Both of us hate doing any of it. And we can't afford to have someone who just does chores in our house all the time right now. Um, so how can we lean in and compromise, even if we're not going to come to a perfect resolution on it right now? So those are the types of things people fight about. And a lot of times on the surface, what they're fighting about isn't the core issue that they're fighting about. I want to just talk about these percentages because it's fascinating. I, 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 you know, there's so many books written about how there are core issues that people will always come back to in a relationship. And just to be able to accept that is important. Mm -hmm. Not to think that, oh, well, we're so dysfunctional because we can't get on the same page about certain things. I think, you know, respect first, first of all, is first and foremost, you know, the fact that we can disagree and we don't have to see eye to eye on everything is is Mm -hmm. super important. Uh, But the other thing that you talked about before, and I think this is sort of where we're going a little bit, is that um, we fight because we're standing for something. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to defend a value of ours, a need of ours, something that we care about. I don't think people really think about that very much, that when something important to us has been stepped on, disrespected, Mm -hmm. that's why we take a stand for it and we get upset with it. Mm-hmm. So if you can speak to, to that a little bit about, you know, why, why we get so triggered by these things that we, then we get into these fights. Mm-hmm. Right. So a lot of it goes back to those, those, the way that we're feeling about ourselves or the way I like to say it is the stories that we're telling ourselves about ourselves. So if I go to the example of the, um, of the chores, the splitting of chores in our house, then typically what my husband and I end up fighting about is I'm typically the one who will bring it up because the story I'm telling myself is he doesn't appreciate the fact that I work full time. Therefore he doesn't care. He doesn't, I don't feel loved. I don't feel liked. I don't feel respected because of that. He would say, and I know because we've had this conversation and it's the same every time he would say that he does not feel appreciated for what he does do. And, and instead of me thanking him and pointing out and being appreciative of what he's doing and calling that out more, then that makes him feel like he's not respected or liked or loved. So we're both feeling the same way at the core, but the way that's kind of presenting itself and, um, is a constant, is a constant thing that we work on. So I'm constantly, I'm a, I run a company that works with marriages and I still have to do this to myself. I still have to talk to myself and say, Kimberly, what is my goal of when I have this conversation with Rob? That's my husband. What is my goal? What is it that I'm wanting him to feel? Am I, do I want him to feel attacked? No. Do I want to try and make him defensive? Absolutely not. Because what my core need is, and I have to ask myself and actually stop and think, what is my core need? My core need is to know that he's on my team and just for him to give me a reminder of that. And for me, if, if it's, if it's appropriate for me to say, you know what, but I have been doing way more of the laundry than normal there. So can you be more proactive in looking at that this week? But the question is, how can I say that in a way that is productive to our relationship and not, not destructive? And so I have to do this all the time. He has to do it back towards me. Like we have to learn how to conflict well with each other, because if I were to go to him and say, why are you dragging your feet? Why aren't you, you should be doing the laundry more. Like, come on, don't you see that I work eight hours a day or 10 or whatever? How do you think he's going to respond to that? Defensiveness. Defensive, <laughs> contempt, like all of these things could have been right. um, But instead, if I go to him and I say, Rob, I am just really needing your help right now. First of all, emotionally, because I am overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed at work. And these are the stories I'm telling myself this, that, or the other, can you reassure me in this? And I, I ask, like, I get what I need from him first. Cause really that's what I need. Like emotionally, that's more, t- more times than not what I'm needing. And then from there I can say, you know what, it would really help if you could pick up with the laundry this week, a little bit more than normal. I would really appreciate it as I'm trying to get through this. How much more receptive to that is he going to be? than the first example, right? Like you're so much more willing. We are so much more willing as people to lean in and help others 
when we know that they appreciate what we do and they love us and they appreciate us. So it's, it's translating that into our relationships and how we approach the significant others in our life with conflict that makes all the difference. Yeah, I love the way you broke that down. Let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Amazon Music Unlimited. You can listen to over 70 million songs and thousands of playlists and stations. Plus, you can now stream your favorite podcasts like Last First Date Radio. You can listen to any song, anytime, anywhere, on any of your devices. Get Amazon Music Unlimited for free for 30 days. Just head on over to getamazonmusic.com forward slash last first date to learn more and claim this offer. I think that most people don't even know where to start with themselves. And so Mm -hmm. how can you help people who don't even know, like, what am I needing? What's going on Mm -hmm. for me? Because I think people get so triggered and they're, Mm -hmm. they're so reactive when they're triggered. So what are some, some great tips for, for people who want to just kind of calm down and then get clear? That's such a great question on a very foundational level. A great first thing to do is simply stop. So one of the things I have had to learn to do, and I teach other people to do this too, with the clients we work with at marriage helper is (sighs) breathe. Like stop when you, when you really want to say something, that's probably when you should stop, (laughs) breathe and just take a minute. And then from there, if there are people who are listening to this, who say, okay, like I get that. I've heard that I can, I can start implementing that, but I still don't know how to check in with my feelings. A really simple thing you can do is Google the feelings wheel. It might be called the emotions wheel. And it's this beautiful wheel that on the outside shares the, the eight large emotions. So scared, glad, mad. Um, I can't remember all of them right now, but it's, it's those. And then it breaks them down even further to, to where it has probably 50 to 150 emotion words on this wheel so that people can start to learn to identify, okay, yes, I'm mad, but what, like what deeper than that? And is it because I, I feel offended? Is it because I feel slighted, taken advantage of? And it can really help a person to begin to just label, this is the emotion I'm feeling. And then once you get there, you can ask yourself, why? And it may take sitting with that for an hour, maybe even a day, maybe even a week for you to really understand and just think, why am I so hurt right now? Because here's what we know about anger specifically and talking about that emotion, um, which is typically what leads to conflict is there's always some kind of pain that underlies the emotion of anger. There's something deeper that's there. So dig into that, like figure out what is it at your core that's going on? What is the story you're telling yourself about it? And what is it you need right now? It's pretty clear. <laughs> uh, I love it. I, 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 so the emotion wheel, and I've used uh, the nonviolent communication list, which are just huge. Uh, that's also helpful. Sometimes it's too overwhelming when you have too many emotions to look at. And, um, and what we also do is there's needs that aren't met, which is why you're feeling the way you do. So the pain underlying the emotion um, is there. And I think it starts with I'm angry, but under anger is usually something else, sadness, um, feeling left out, feeling unheard, feeling unseen, like some of the core things that you talked about before. I just uh, was talking to a client earlier who she's had three guys flake on her this week and Mm. they just don't, didn't show up, you know, like they made a hard promise that they didn't follow through on. And for her, accountability is really important if you're going to mean what you say. Mm -hmm. And if you're starting out a relationship like that, then that's not going to work. And so knowing like, you know what, I, I don't, I don't want to continue talking to somebody who hasn't followed through on a commitment, being able to say that, or to know what even is happening 
to you instead of just going, how dare he do that? All right. Or yelling at the person. Right. But just taking back your power and saying, you know what, that doesn't work for me. Here's what I need, Mm -hmm. you know, and sometimes it's a one-time thing. It's a one-off and it's a mistake and it can change, but often it's, it's who that person is. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, by not accusing, but taking your own power back, um, it's really helpful. So using those kinds of I statements, you know, here's how I feel. This is what I need. And I love the story I'm telling myself part because we do, we make up these big stories about what it must mean. And uh, oh my God, my mother is the queen of this. (laughs) I'll talk to her and she'll be like, I think, you know, my doctor didn't answer the call because I think he went away because, you know, he has a house in the Hamptons. And so I think, you know, he's probably there because I know that he's living with this, but I'm like, what is this? What are you talking about? This is quite the web. Yes, of exactly. Story right here. And you actually don't know what's going on. You have no idea. Like, this is so interesting. You've just written an entire novel about this person and you know, none of this is true. Yeah. So we do this and, you know, some people to a bigger extreme than another, but um, yeah. So I, I love this. I think it's super clear. And um, if you could share like a story about a couple you've worked with where they, you know, you've talked about your own with the chores and that's a big one, but maybe sex or something where it's like one of the big things that people argue about and don't feel like they can resolve and how they resolved it. I'd love to hear. Yeah. So another big one, especially for married couples is in-law problems. Mm -hmm. And so uh, a couple of years ago, we had a client that we, that I was working with, and that was a big issue specifically for, for her because there, she did not feel, and it was true. Like the husband agreed with it too, but she did not feel that the, that his parents were respectful of her or her decisions in regards to how to handle things with the kids and and all of that kind of stuff. And the frustration was he was not saying anything about it. So he, you know, they'd go to the, his parents' house and it would just happen. And her husband was very non-confrontational, right? Like (laughs) lack of conflict doesn't mean things are going well. So he didn't want to have the conflict. So he would just kind of watch it happen even though he was on his wife's side behind closed doors. And so this caused, I mean, there were other problems happening in the marriage, but this was one where it was like, I, she was kept saying, this has to be fixed. I can't move past this. And so what did we do? Well, we worked with both her first into like, how are you communicating this to him? Because if you're communicating in a way where, like we said before, he's feeling defensive or he feels attacked that's not going to be the most helpful. So you tell him how it makes you feel, but also, and this is a key point too, when having conflict with people we love, it's just as important that we are willing to hear what they are experiencing to the same eagerness that we want to share what we are experiencing. So we need to be willing to listen just as much, if not more than we're talking. And so That's when he would finally open up to her when she allowed that time and space to, for him to share some of the things that happened in his past ways that his parents had treated him when he had gone against them and some of the fear that was there. And so she was able to have more of an understanding, more of an empathy of why he was reacting that way, but it still was something that needed to be fixed. So just having the understanding, sometimes that is enough for people. Sometimes it is enough for them to make the decision of, you know what, this isn't a big enough issue to me. I can handle it. I care, you know, I'm good. Like now that they know how I feel and I know how they feel, I'm good. But in other instances like this one, something still needed to be done. And so she, at that point, he was willing to lean in, at least try to lean into the conflict with his parents in a similar way. So he had to be coached through it. He had to be walked through, you know, it's okay to have conflict. Here's how you can set it up. Here's how you, you know, what you can say. And it's still, it's still not a hundred percent fixed. It wasn't one conversation with his parents. Everything was perfect from then on out. He has had to learn. I care enough about my wife. I care enough about my kids that I'm willing to set the boundaries on the front end with my parents and actually follow through with them if they violate any of those boundaries. And so what is all of that? It's a lot of, every part of that is conflict from her talking to her husband about it, 
from him talking to his parents about it and from the continual upkeep of, of those, of that contract of that, of those boundaries, it's conflict. But when you care enough about the relationships, you're willing, you're more willing to do what it takes to keep those relationships going. And if that means conflict, even if you're conflict averse, there becomes a greater why. And I think that's a huge part of reframing what conflict is, is reshifting it into your mind to, it's not that I don't like this person. It's, and maybe I'm scared of what they might think of me or what they might say, or I don't want to just have a fight, but it's reframing it to the bigger. I care so much about this relationship that it is more important for me to work this out now than for it to become a bigger problem in the, in the future because of resentment, because of, um, things just building up, imploding or exploding later because of the lack of getting things out and getting things off your chest, you have to care more about the future of the relationship. That's a really important reframe. I think people think, let's just push it down. I don't want to deal with it. It'll go away. And it doesn't, you Mm -hmm. know, and emotions don't just disappear. If we try not to deal with them, this is why people have things going on in their bodies and stress and all kinds of things that I was just listening to Don Miguel Ruiz, who was saying that he was a medical doctor and he realized that so many of the ailments that people came to him for were psychological. They had Mm -hmm. really very little to do with the body. That's how they manifested. Mm -hmm. And so we do have to talk about this stuff. And we know if we care about someone, we need to talk to them about these things. And I was just recently with my youngest daughter and we were traveling together and it was so filled with conflict and very, very challenging. And at the end, I said, look, I, she was coming home in a few weeks for a couple of weeks. And I said, I don't think we should live together. I think this is, you know, we've tried, we've, I was trying to name all the parts that we could work on, you know, the more positivity in the relationship and how to, um, had it pause before reacting and all the things, mm-hmm. a lot of the things that we've talked about today. But I said, you know, I think you should live with your dad when you come home. Uh, we do better when we don't live together. And she came home and she said, well, I, I'm going to stay with you until I get COVID tested and then I'll go to dad's. And then she really liked being with me and it was really cozy and she was able to not wear a mask all the time because her dad was a little more COVID scared and So I said, okay, you can stay unless we really get into a lot of conflict. And we lasted about 10 days and I just, I had it. I mean, I I addressed it each time it came up and I just said, this is it. You've got to pack your bags and go to your dad's. I love you and you've got to go. And she was really, really hurt by what I did. I had been very clear from the beginning. This is a favor. I am not happy to do this if we don't get along, but I will give you a chance. You're my daughter. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was really, really hard, but I, within a couple of days, we were totally okay. And it worked out to be the best thing for her father, for her and for me. And so sometimes you have to really set a super clear boundary, even Mm -hmm. with people that are your children or people that you love that, you know, it can feel harsh in the moment. I'm just wondering if, you know, if you would have handled that any differently. Oh goodness. Well, (laughs) it's also, and that's the other thing when about conflict is it's so situational, right? So there's years of history with your daughter that I would never know about because I haven't lived it, breathed it, experienced it. I think the best thing we can do is when having the conflict, if we can show love to that. So in this sense, right? Like make sure your daughter feels loved, even if she may not like what is happening. If she feels loved and you're willing to be open and continuing that relationship, then I think that's, that that is healthy and positive. And there's different ways that you can do that. I love what Brene Brown says, where she says, clear is kind, unclear is unkind. Mm -hmm. And I think there are people in society who take advantage of that. I think there are people who set a lot of rules 
um, you know, like, well, you, in order for me to be in a relationship with you, you have to basically be perfect. Like you have to do this right and that right and that right. And if not, then I'm done with you. That's not, that might be clear, but that's not a kind approach to it. So I think it's this healthy balance of what is it I really need to have a healthy relationship with someone else, but how do I show that back? And am I being the person Mm -hmm. that, that they want to be around? It's always key to, to look back in that mirror. Yeah, I agree. I think one of the hardest things we do is to say, how are we contributing and Mm -hmm. what can we do differently? And I've always said that my daughter has been my greatest teacher because we have the most conflict and Mm -hmm. she has shown me that boundaries are really important. Mm -hmm. And when I am not following through on a boundary, I'm not being true to myself or to her and I'm not being clear. And so that boundary then becomes a very flimsy little line that can be crossed. And that's really confusing. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, no, and I I have reached out to her many times to connect in the ways that both of us can appreciate, you know, it's not, Mm -hmm. it's not easy with some people to find ways to connect that work for both of you. But it's important to let the person know that you are there, and you do love them. I agree with that, but I, you know, I love Brene Brown and I love her Atlas of the Heart. I've been, I'm in the middle of that right now. It's her, her book about emotions is oh, so interesting. Yet. Really interesting because she groups emotions in uh, these really interesting categories and goes through like maybe 80 seven emotions, but she puts them in little groupings of mm. how we feel when when we feel a sense of belonging, um, Mm -hmm. how we feel when, you know, and so it's, that's really fascinating. I'm, uh, it takes a while to get through it. It's a, it's a very dense book, but it's really, really good. I just wrote it down. I'm going to add it to my 2022 reading list. Okay, good. Yeah. I, uh, there's actually book clubs on Facebook for this book because it's, it's so intense that I feel like chapter by chapter, we need to go through it. Um, yeah, so you just let's talk about as we, we come to a close um, that sometimes you say we have to agree to disagree. Mm-hmm. And I know you've said like we've have, we have all these, these areas of conflict that don't get resolved. Mm-hmm. So what do you mean by that? And how do we deal with that? Yeah, it goes back to that, that statistic from earlier that 69% of the conflict that we have is not going to be resolved. And so there really are times where you agree to disagree. Let's look at the last year in America, right? Like this is a prime example. <laughs> no, thank you. Um, <laughs> you know, like let's, let's, not, let's just keep that in, in the past. But there were so many different things that came up that a lot of people ended friendships over, ended family relationships over because there were people on two different sides. And they could, they, it's not that they could not, they would not agree to disagree. They would not lean into why is this important to the other person? Like, let me understand their story and why it matters this way to them. That wasn't happening in, in a lot of places. And so friendships, relationships have ended. Whereas it's so much healthier for a society. It's so much healthier for us as people to yes, like have your own beliefs and values and stay, stay true to them. But sometimes there's going to be people that you love and care about, and they don't have the same beliefs and value. When you respect that about each other, which respect says, I am going to accept that the fact that you feel that way. And I'm going to treat you with the same amount of respect as I would, if you had the exact same belief as me, like, I'm not going to treat you less than I'm not going to see you as inferior to me because you think differently, that's what respect is. And so if we could respect people and just agree, like I see your point, I respect you. And I, I ask that you see my point and respect me and not try to change each other. That's where it gets really murky and really, really muddy real quick. Because it, all of a sudden, if I feel like I need to change something about myself in order for another person to love me, the, the, the trust in that relationship is starting to evaporate because yeah. you don't accept me for who I am. You accept me for who you want me to be. And I can't, I can't live with a mask on, not in a political sense. I can't live with my, with that mask on, like behind with that wall of that perfect picture of who you want me to be on the other side, 
I have to feel accepted for who I am. So that's what it means. Agree to disagree about some things because there are some things it's not worth ending the relationship over. There's some things it might be. And those things are going to be a whole lot more personal, probably, uh, you know, things like a, if you're in a relationship with someone who is an alcoholic and they are continuing to do things that are harmful to you and to them, you may have to make the decision of this isn't just an agree to disagree moment. This is a, like, how am I going to make sure that I am safe and that you are safe and we may need to end the relationship? Um, so you have to decide, is this something like the hill you want to die on? Is it the battle you want to fight or can, can you agree to disagree? Yeah. Yeah. We've certainly had a big divide in the last year, two years. And, um, I once had a a friend who started just spewing political stuff at me and anybody who voted for this other person was a terrible person. And I, I just said, I can't have this conversation in this way. And if you want to continue with our friendship, we have to be able to speak kindly to each other. And she said, well, if that's off the table, then forget it. And this was like a 20 year friendship. She just ended it overnight. So it hurt in the beginning, but I was like, I don't want to be friends with somebody who's going to say those things. Right. Right. So Kimberly, any last words of advice for anybody who wants to go on their last first date? (laughs) Oh, <laughs> I, I really lean into asking myself the question and asking the, the clients that I work with the question of how, what are you doing to be the best you that you can be? And instead of focusing so much on whether or not the other person's going to like you or whether or not they're doing everything that they can just really pouring into that, that self-care, that self-worthiness, that self-confidence And, and that can show up in, in conflict, right? I mean, you can be more likely to be willing to address conflict or handle it when you know you are worthy, you are good, you are confident. It can give you what you need to, to address some of those hard issues. So when you're looking to go on your last first date, ask yourself, what am I doing to be, to also be answering that question for the other person? Like, how am I forming and transforming myself into the best me that I can be for me first. And then for a a future relationship, possibly in the future, but we have to do it for ourselves first and foremost. I love that. Well, this was such a great conversation, Kimberly. Thank you so much. And if you can let people know the best way to find you, that'd be great. Yes. That's great. So you can find my podcast and you can listen to it after you listen to Sandy's each week. (laughs) Uh, It starts with attraction is what it's called. And I dive into what I just said. So I'm really passionate about, um, I call it the pies, physical, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual attraction. And so every week I'm releasing episodes specifically on, on those topics. So go listen to an episode, follow me there. And then you can also follow me personally on Instagram at Kimberly Beam Holmes. And if you're married, then you can go and check us out at marriagehelper.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I'm sure people will go check out your fabulous website and podcast and Instagram and all your good stuff. And um, thanks everybody for listening today. If you love our show, please give us a rating and a review. And as always, here's to your last first date. If you are ready to get unstuck, gain new tools, become more empowered, and finally find your last first date, I'd love to talk to you. Fill out an application to be considered for a complimentary half-hour love breakthrough session at lastfirstdate.com forward slash application. That's lastfirstdate.com forward slash application. I look forward to talking to you soon.